don't know. I, no, oh. I'm just going to pass it around. Yeah. yeah. The bill is here. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I feel so protected with the mask on. You know, you want to put it back on. I, I think we can start. Good morning. Welcome to the Treasure Coast Unitarian Universalist Congregation here in Stewart, Florida. Today is July 31st, 2022. Hard to believe that the summer is almost halfway over, that hot part. My name is Pam Corbin, and I'll be your worship associate today. We are a welcoming congregation. We welcome people of all gender identities, ethnicities, ages, and backgrounds. I'm going to ask you to look at your phone and see that you've turned it off. It won't ring unless you're a cop and you are needed for emergency services. It's wonderful to see all of our vaccinated members in the sanctuary, and we're on YouTube as well. To be put on our email list or to find out more information about us, please go to the website at TCC, please, T-C-U-U-C, Dot org. Note the email link to request our online newsletter. Okay, I want to know if we have some visitors today, and this is not a, a pressure thing. If you feel comfortable, would you please stand up and tell us who you are? Hi, we have a Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, we have some announcements, and one of those is the infamous brown bag lunch. It's on the first and third. Tuesdays of the month at the Stewart Veterans Memorial Park downtown at noon. Uh, it is not a formal affair. It is not clothing optional. It is come and enjoy a bit of gossip, information exchange, food exchange, Oh, okay. Thank you for saying that. I'm going to speak up louder and tell me. Okay. So on the first and third Tuesdays of um, the month at the Stewart Veterans Memorial Park downtown, uh, Stewart, we have our infamous brown bag lunch. 
And at Brown Bag Lunch, everybody brings their own food. It's not clothing optional. It's a lot of fun. And we sometimes exchange food. And we gossip and we talk about current events. And it is a fun time. Sometimes we're just saying to one another, this is the name of my doctor. This is what I do on this specific day. But it is a, a, an exchange of information. And we started this because during the lockdown, we missed one another. And I do miss you. Um, we have a, a thank you, a big thank you to those who helped with the service. Jackie Robbins. OK, people mess up her name, so I'm going to make sure to say it right. She's not the baseball player, Jackie Robinson. That little boy will be Jackie Robinson. Yes, right. <laughs> but I think I've made that mistake once, and um, I want to apologize. But her name is Jackie Robbins. And uh, we'd like to thank her for the music. We have our greeters. Um, we, from time to time, we have a really handsome group of men that are the greeters. So if you were a greeter, would you please raise your hand so people can see who you are? See? There you go. We have some really good, handsome guys. <laughs> we have our, our host, um, Karina Poloni, and our tech whiz, Chris McGann. For coffee and cookies on the patio, we have Marguerite Greg, uh, Gregory. And Marguerite, would you raise your hand so people can see who you are? So, and I can say that one of the things during the lockdown when the church was really not open, I missed the coffee hour. I really did miss the coffee hour. So we do have a prelude, and we're going to ask. Okay. Um, on Friday, there was a celebration of life for Pat Malone, who was an Irish Catholic all of his life, and he found a, a great community here and joined the church uh, several months ago uh, here at, at the Unitarian Universalist Church, and, and his eyes were always smiling, so I'm going to play for when I wish eyes are smiling for him. about a third of the size to actually be heard.
Janet Grote and I will be in the pulpit today, and the subject is Growing Up UU. Judith Watt was supposed to be here, but is not feeling well, and so she could not come. So, um, how's the sound? Still a little bit low? That was Karina Poloni. So we'll need someone to light the chalice. And I do have some opening words. So um, the opening words are um, something that I struggle with, and I think some of you may struggle with, and one of those things is guilt, but the other thing is forgiveness. So I have a few quotes about forgiveness, and see if it helps you. Forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it. Forgiveness requires strength and the ability to see that its true benefit is for your own happiness. If someone stole from you, holding on to resentment won't bring your things back, but it will keep anger alive in your heart. If you were cheated on or deceived, holding on to anger won't make that person any more honest or undo anything that's been done. <clears throat> but it will keep a place in your heart imprisoned, allowing past anger to exist in the present will damage or limit new relationships. We do have a, a hymn. Um, and it is hymn number 38, Morning Has Broken. Time we're going to uh, recite our affirmation, and our affirmation starts with, love is the spirit of this church. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another.
This is the wonderful part of our service, and we call it Joys and Sorrows. Please step up to the microphone and tell us your name first. Move a stone from the bowl. It's a, a, a symbol of the river of life. Then you, after you say your joy or your sorrow, you move the stone into um, the river. Try to keep it uh, personal and brief, but I'm not going to put any pressure on you. And I really appreciate it when you tell what's going on in your life to the rest of us. I know it's personal, but um, I would like to hear it, and I am interested, and so are others. Do we have anybody here for joys and sorrows? Anybody that will start us off? Please come. Good morning, I'm Pat Burt, and I'm all joy today because my dear beloved Tim and Jamie are here. And that not only is a wonderful um, thing just to have them here, but it also means that I'm getting to have my first vacation in six years. And those of you who travel constantly better feel really guilty. <laughs> Tim is going to take my place at home with his dad, and Jamie and I are going to snorkel all around Key West. Hello, my name is Jackie Robbins, and I have a joy, which is that I have been mentoring a family, a really fine family, since the kids are, you know, like this big, and now they're all taller than I am, and on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 3 p.m. at St. Mary's Episcopal Church, there will be a showcase of, of uh, their talents. And, you know, one kid is at Juilliard, two of them are down at Lynn University Conservatory of Music, and the 13-year-old is taking lessons, and I'll be playing with them. And we will be playing a Bach Brandenburg Concerto. Um, and mostly they'll be playing solos by themselves, so you can see some local talent, and it gives me a great joy to, to be part of this uh, community. Thank you. Uh, Sunday, the se August 7th at 3 p.m., on Southeast Ocean Boulevard, St. Mary's, right across from the hospital. Oh, at the Pet Pittenger Center. Not in the chapel. Stone? Big stone, big family. <laughs> at first I thought maybe this was too trivial to come up about, but I, thinking about it, it is a real joy. I'm, I'm not usually dressed like this for church, and uh, it's because I just came from uh, playing pickleball with John, and um, he, you know, I've had a lot of, um, I thought I couldn't play pickleball anymore because of pain, you know, arthritis and all that, and uh, John invited me to play doubles with him and uh, in a tournament coming up in a couple of weeks, and, and so I've been kind of modulating how I play, right? Taking it easy, this, that, and the other. And, and I'm able to play. It's a, it's a real joy because I, I needed that in my life. Um, uh, the other joy is um, yesterday attending the, um, we saw um, a mosaic that was unveiled for the, um, in the Creek District um, uh, in downtown Stewart. And uh, our own Karina Poloni has already has uh, one um, mosaic that you, you should see for sure. Uh, this was a, a, a new one that was um, unveiled, but hers is down there. It's absolutely gorgeous down there on MLK near the uh, Colab restaurant. We got to see it up close yesterday, and it, uh, it's, it was, it's a joy. We're so proud of her. The stone. Hi, I'm Linda Shuey. I just, um, I want to express great gratitude for being alive. Um, we forget every day. Um, at last week, uh, Tuesday night, um, I've had atrial fib for years, and Tuesday night it was out of control. I kind of knew after three hours 
and I went into the ER, and I have such gratitude to all health workers, um, especially when you know that they really care. I know they're getting paid for this. Um, they had the whole ER full of people um, trying to get my heart rate to slow down, and I didn't really take it all that seriously until the ER doctor said, if your heart stops, do you want us to shock you? <laughs> and I said, well, of course. <laughs> Um, so uh, anyway, now um, I'm off to find an electrophysiologist, and maybe ha um, there is something they can do. They gave me some medication, which is making me very, very sick. So um, I guess it's just gratitude. We've all felt gratitude to the health workers we've seen in the last two years, but they, they are amazing to make a commitment to that kind of a career. Thank you. Hi, my name's Bill Falk. I'm the president of the board of directors here. Not that that's that significant for this, but what I came up to say is I wanted to put a stone in in memory of Pat Malone, who Jackie made reference to a bit ago. Some of us were at his memorial service on Friday and um, heard a, quite a bit, especially from one of his relatives, his sister, I'm not quite sure if it was one of his siblings, he was from a big Catholic family, Irish Catholic family, 12 siblings. I mean, this gives you a football team with one substitute, so, you know, pretty big. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to just put a stone in because Pat, as uh, I said at the service on Sunday, and as Bob McDonald, who conducted the service, said, well, having grown up Irish Catholic, found us as part of his family late in his life, and we're glad he did. Dennis? Is there anyone else who would like to share their joys or sorrows? For those of you who have, oh wait, one more. Good morning, everybody. I'm Barney Miller Moore. And I wasn't going to say this because it's really trivial, but I am going to say it. Yesterday, I was on a juice fast, so juice all day. And then John, my husband, who thought there may have been a really serious problem with his neck, discovered that it wasn't after a doctor's visit, but he couldn't cut the grass. I cut the back and the front. Yesterday, we have really big yard <laughs> and and I did it I did it well <laughs> Thanks. for those whose joys and sorrows are too private to share know that our hearts are with you and we're going to put a stone into the river for you now, now let's sing hymn number one, two, three, Spirit of Life. We hum the first verse, and then we sing the second time through. Thank you. 
passing the offering plate was never just a practical exercise. It has always been a ritual. Even if your pledge is paid up, it's worthwhile for you to bring even just a dollar to drop in the plate as a ritual reminder of that form of love we call generosity. The practice of giving until its second nature and first response helps bring forth the realm of love. Could we have those people that we asked to um, pass, pass the offering plates? Can we have those people come forward? This is a short Telemann piece, George Frederick Telemann. <laughs> Offering is gratefully received. Thank you. And now we're going to on to our, our sermon and speeches about growing up you, you. And I guess I'm going first. Mm -hmm. So I've been told to keep it short, so I am going to keep it short. I am a Unitarian child because my parents brought me to the Unitarian Church. And I'll just give you a, a little bit of our background. We are, um, I came to the South Nassau Unitarian Church when I was 11. We were Lutheran before. My parents were first generation Americans. Our families came from the Caribbean, Barbados, Bermuda, and Jamaica. It was World War II that was the turning point in my um, family's life. My parents, um, join the segregated military. They did not know one another. When my mother was in high school, she uh, was spotted by a teacher as being somebody who could benefit um, with some extra uh, education. So she was nominated to go to Hunter College High School. And she was taught German at Hunter College High School. Um, she became, when the war effort came out, she became a G-girl. Does anybody remember what a G-girl was? It's all of these people that volunteered for government work. They were called G-girls. And she was a postal censor. Both my parents, my father had a couple of years of college at Boston College. Both my parents wanted to help win the war. Remember, the nation was segregated basically segregated, but they said that the propaganda to help our country win the war affected even those people who were being discriminated against here in the United States. The military was totally um, segregated, and but for my parents, the GI Bill was the reward. And once again, my parents did not know one another until after the war was over. Uh, Church of the Brethren was their religion at the time, was my mother's religion, and it was very restrictive. Women couldn't wear pants, makeup, go to the theater, go to the movies. But schooling opened their eyes. They used that GI Bill to get ahead. So because they only wanted black doctors to treat black troops, they or black um, engineers to lead engineering battalions. Um, while my father was in the service, he just took a test. And if he passed the test, he could choose to go to medical school or engineering school, and he chose medical school. And so my father was in 
the military and going to, you guessed it, a all-black um, medical school called Meharry, part of Fisk University in Tennessee. Um, when my mother got out of the military and my parents had gotten married because they had such a similar background, my mother came to the South Nassau Unitarian Church and she heard the French horn playing during the service and she said, this is the right place. <laughs> I should let you know that that um, church, uh, we called it Snuck, um, that church um, I had run an abortion clinic for years <laughs> in a house on the property. Our minister ran for Congress on the anti-Vietnam platform. There was an active Sunday school and summer camp. We had JYF, I don't know if there are any other Unitarian children here. We had JYF and LRY. LRY stood for Liberally Religious um, root, uh, Youth. The church was entirely civil rights oriented. In senior year um, in my high school, my high school said that they weren't teaching black history because black people never contributed anything to the history of the United States. We subsequently boycotted school, which we knew would hurt the school because as, uh, the monies that the school got was based on your attendance. And so they ceased to get money for us. And I, along with, um, I don't know, maybe 100 other students, um, we were arrested in a civil rights demonstration in our, our school. And we subsequently went to Freedom School at, you guessed it, the South Nassau Unitarian Church. And for months and months and months, I never went to regular senior year high school. I went to school at my church. The church was known for active protesters. Active. There were artists and actors. It was diversity central. Diversity central. And there were a lot of interreligious couples. And what was interesting about the people who married people of other religions is that they told the students what, they had hap what had happened to them when they married somebody else from another religion. And basically, their families never spoke to them again. And so they found a home at the Unitarian Church. Adults told children their stories, how they grew up. We were a more intimate group because we were smaller and we knew our teachers. Um, some of those were um, things like you were in a religion that required you to marry somebody of the same religion. And you knew already that if you fell in love with someone who was not of your religion, they would, um, one teacher said they, they tore a piece of material from their suits and said, you are no longer mine. And the tearing of the material meant that that, my, what was then my teacher, they, they really never did speak to them again. Never. So that's what I grew up with was this, extraordinarily challenged, um, uh, extraordinarily active, out there, wonderfully educated, uh, liberal group of people. And that's why I, I, I know I'm a Unitarian because I, I can never understand how everybody could be so mean to one another in another religion. In, it because it happened to friends of mine. Um, when I came to this church, this is what happened. I was on crutches. I um, broke my leg. And typical Unitarians, I came in, and I only wanted to sit in the back, and I had my head, uh, leg in a brace, and I was on crutches. And uh, a man here at the church said, she's sitting with me. <laughs> She, she's going to be with me. That's the way people are. We're, we may be a little off. <laughs> but the person insisted, and I was like, okay. But I knew I was in the right place because 
Um, that's more than welcoming. It's insistence. No, no, she's ours. She sits over here. So um, that's how I'm uh, a Unitarian. I have to remember sometimes that other people are not as um, liberal as I am. You know, I'll say abortion, and somebody will say, we don't talk about that here. And I go, oh, yeah, I'm not at my church. I'm not, I'm not with um, a group of people. And then I switch it over to, I don't care that you don't care, that you don't talk about that. That's all on you. Um, I deal with the real world. But this is a wonderful place. And Unitarian churches basically are, are like this all over. They embrace you. They don't care who you sleep with. I mean, you could bring in Martians, and somebody would say, the Martians, he's going to be with me. Martians going to be on my side. So that's, that's what we're like. And I hope I kept it short. I was raised as a Unitarian Universalist. Now, here is Joseph Hall Patton. Cypher here, and today I've got a weird one for you. Every once in a while I like to go down a research rabbit hole, and then I find an interesting story behind something that I was just curious about. It always starts with the same sort of question, basically, why did something happen? And today I want to talk about one such hole I dug. Hey, wait a minute. Since when is Pismo Beach inside a cave? I wonder, uh, you know, I just bet we should have turned left at Albuquerque, and then maybe... You see, I grew up going to a Unitarian Universalist church. This is not your normal Christian sect. Not at all. In contrast, I was raised in a Lutheran church, which is pretty normal by comparison. That was Grant, the casual historian, who was doing his own episode on Lutherans in America. The Unitarians, on the other hand, kind of don't have a defined theology or really any belief set that you can fixate on. In fact, it's almost the lack of a defined theology that defines them. My religious education when I was growing up was about going to other religions and finding out what they were about. You know, like going to Protestant sects, a mosque, both Mormon and Jewish temples, Catholic Mass, and even a couple of days at a Buddhist temple. I never really returned to the UUs once I became an adult, but that religious education has really stuck with me. So when I later became a history major, I was surprised to find out that the Unitarians were once one of the most, if not the most, powerful sect of Christianity in America at one point. Thomas Jefferson had said, I confidently expect that the present generation will see Unitarians become the general religion of the United States. Almost a century later, a Unitarian minister was called the preacher who saved the nation. And I remember thinking once I learned all that, how could a religion that was more concerned about teaching other religions than its own history have come from such an exalted position? I didn't know. And in the process of trying to find out, this is what I dug up. Unitarian Universalism is very different from what it once was. Universalism was joined in 1961, well after Unitarians had fallen from the height of political power. So I'm mostly focusing on Unitarians here. Unitarianism was originally a form of Protestant Christianity that believed God and Christ were separate beings. Jesus Christ! What? Get the Escalade, we're out of here. This was in specific opposition to the primary theology of Christianity, where the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, are seen as one thing. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Goat. G g g ghost. There is a long history of anti-Trinitarian thought, but until the Reformation, these beliefs were normally persecuted out of existence. Even Muhammad was opposed to the Trinity. He said, Say not three, cease. It is better for you. Allah is only one God. But let's just skip to England in the 17th century, where Unitarians usually trace their lineage. John Biddle, who is often called the father of Unitarianism, died while imprisoned for his beliefs in 1662. Even though there were many before him, the infamy of the intolerance against him spread. His writings and beliefs became a movement. They were still persecuted by the Anglican Church, but it could not be stopped any longer. Even when the Toleration Act was passed in 1689, Unitarians were exempted. It wouldn't be until 1813 that Unitarian beliefs were allowed in Britain. Unitarians couldn't hold office, could be fined or imprisoned, and even have their congregations broken up by the police up until 1813. The belief was kept alive through secret movements in academia, as a kind of radical theology for more progressive thinking students and professors. They were not a coherent group, but Unitarians were sometimes Congregationalists, Arminians, and Arians. These dissenters wanted tolerance, and that became a key part of Unitarian theology. The New World colonies allowed for much more tolerance, and many English dissenters fled there. By the early 18th century, Unitarian preachers were easy to find. During the Great Awakening of the 1730s and 40s, they were opposed to the angry sermons given by New Light revivalists. Their liberal beliefs did not allow for blanket condemnations that the revivals of the Awakening fostered. The New Light preachers turned their condemnations to Unitarians. But instead of reacting badly, the Unitarian preachers said things like, an enlightened mind, not raised affections, ought always to be the guide of those who call themselves men. These liberal sentiments kept Unitarians popular among the learned elite. Lutherans, on the other hand, were very conservative in their sentiments and theology, which reflected in their social isolation from English colonial society as well as later American society. Unlike the Lutherans, the Unitarians were still a disjointed group without a singular name. A kind of renaissance man named Joseph Priestley came to America because of religious persecution in England. He was famous for many things, including the discovery of what he called deflagisticated air, but we now know as oxygen, but that was just idle doodling. As he said, My favorite pursuit is the propagation of Unitarian beliefs. He wrote a letter in 1774 proposing the term Unitarian be used for all these disparate groups. Many were not ready for institutionalization and new religious movements were still affecting the American Unitarians. As movements like deism became popular in the revolutionary period. I mean, look at the Hubble telescope. It's discovered untold wonders of a vast unexplored universe, but not one picture of a guy with a beard sitting around on a cloud. I mean, what's he doing up there? People like Jefferson began to believe in a form of Unitarianism. Not to be outdone by the likes of Jefferson, Adams was a practicing Unitarian, along with his son. In fact, we've had four Unitarian presidents. While there was a lot of rumbling about Unitarians because of such affiliations, the church was not yet the most influential one in America. But the beginning of the 19th century would change that. Harvard was originally founded as a seminary school. It was also the foremost college in the United States, even then. Though it had branched out from that original purpose, the Divinity School remained its most powerful institution. In 1805, Unitarians captured Harvard with the election of Henry Ware, making the school heavily Unitarian. This caused some folks to flee the Divinity School and found their own Calvinist schools. With Harvard captured, the top seminary in America was under the control of Unitarians. Soon, many other seminaries would follow. You have to remember, religion dictated many colleges at the time. Ware kept Harvard non-denominational, as was part of the whole liberal sentiment of Unitarianism, but the influence was obvious and very strong. It came to the point that the entire Unitarian faith was openly debated throughout the country. These debates became known as the Unitarian Controversy. It was such a big thing at the time that most of Boston churches were Unitarian. 
When the Second Great Awakening began, Unitarians didn't involve themselves, and were often seen as an alternative to all the revivalism, basically because of the whole rational liberalism that defined their faith. So they became increasingly prominent even while debating their own principles. A good example of this was a Harvard alumni named William Ellery Channing. He basically defined what it was to be a Unitarian for generations, which led to the creation of the American Unitarian Association in 1825. He refused to join, but the leadership of the new organization followed his word closely. The AUA was also extremely political. It pushed for the abolition of slavery and women's suffrage by the 1850s. This caused much trouble with the older clergy like Channing, since they didn't think an organized body of Unitarians should wield such power. This was difficult enough, but there was another shakeup brewing in Harvard. A Unitarian named Ralph Waldo Emerson published an essay called Nature in 1836. He said, The happiest man is he who learns from nature the lesson of worship. With that, he blatantly stepped from the church to found his own group called Transcendentalists. This is essentially a philosophy more than a theology. Its name is a reference to Kant. Yes, that's right, Kant. That's how you pronounce it. Not Kant, not Kant, not Jones, but Kant. It's a German name, and I'm quite happy to sit here in silence until you're mature enough to get over it. The whole idea is similar to the cynical virtue of happiness. But instead of mere happiness, it is meaning that one derives from nature. Transcendentalism led to some of the greatest American literature of the time, including Walden from Henry David Thoreau. It was the first truly American philosophy, which Emerson declared just that when he said, We will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak our own minds. Then shall man be no longer a name for pity, for doubt, and for sensual indulgence. The dread of man and the love of man shall be a wall of defense and a wreath of joy around all. A nation of men will for the first time exist because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. Despite Emerson calling the church the corpse-cold Unitarianism of Harvard College and Brattle Street, the movement was intrinsically linked with Unitarianism. Most of the people who attended the Transcendental Club remained Unitarians, but this infused a dangerous ideology into Unitarian theology. This spiritualism would lie in wait, eroding from within the cohesion Unitarians had just achieved, but for the time being, they were still powerful. Watch this. I can show you how to get the sweetest deals online when you shop from major retailers like Amazon and Target. You can drop prices automatically. The accomplishments of Unitarians prior to the Civil War would be too much to list. For instance, the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded in 1833 by a Unitarian. The Seneca Falls Convention that began the women's rights movement in 1848 was replete with Unitarians and Universalists, and its declaration of sentiments was heavily influenced by Transcendentalism. And Thomas Starr King, the preacher who saved the nation, was a Unitarian and Universalist who used his liberal faith to campaign against secessionists in California during the secession crisis. For a century afterwards, it was common for Californians to consider him the reason why California did not join the Confederacy, but that is pretty reductionist. Unitarians remained prominent during the Civil War as well. They were abolitionists after all, so they heavily sided with the Union and provided much political support. For instance, Mary Livermore, who was already a major women's rights advocate, pushed the creation of the Sanitary Commission, which provided for medical relief and began modern field medicine in America, and she happened to be a Unitarian. The war also brought the Unitarians and Universalists closer together in common cause, but things changed after the war. A rising tide of spiritualism swept the nation. Seances and spiritual healing were already popular before the war, but with the deadliness of such a war, spiritualism came back with force. It eroded Unitarian and Universalist congregations from the inside. Why are you dedicating your life to blasphemy? Don't worry, sweetheart. If I'm wrong, I'll recant on my deathbed.
cut that a little bit short, but I hope you enjoyed it. Had to um, find a substitute for Judith. <laughs> I must confess, I am a bit of a fraud. I grew up with a Unitarian identity, but I rarely went to church. And if I went to Sunday school under the age of six, I don't remember much. I only remember Easter dresses. Many of you may recall me saying that when I was a kid, I divine, defined the Unitarian church as a place where people of mixed marriages go. And by that, it was meant Christian and Jews. My parents were high school sweethearts in Inglewood, not too far from downtown LA. Mom's best friend, Janet Hauser, was Jewish, and yes, I am named after her. She married Bill Holmes, who was not Jewish. I imagine that is why I developed a peculiar elevator definition of Unitarianism when I was a kid. I remember a big old church. I had to look up First Unitarian of Los Angeles to learn a bit of history. Founded by a famous suffragette, Carolyn Severance, in 1877, in the 50s and 60s, the church took strong stands against the Korean and Vietnam wars. The congregation refused to sign a loyalty oath to the United States, which the state of California required of nonprofits in a condition of keeping that status. The church issued a press statement saying, while Unitarians yield to none in the degree of their loyalty to this country, they also yield to none in their determination to protect religious, philosophical, and political freedom. The church sued in an effort to overturn the law, and get this, the US Supreme Court ruled in favor a first Unitarian invalidating the law. No wonder my parents opposed the Vietnam War and they said they would, would have sent me to Canada had I been a boy. Back to my childhood. When I was two years old, my mom declared that she was a Unitarian and dragged dad along. I think her mother, to whom I was very close, had some universalist roots, but all I remember is an odd spirit, mystical spiritual take on the Bible. She said, if you need an answer, just open to a random page and the answer will be there. Mom's dad, to whom I was also close, defined himself as an atheist. He read Thoreau, Emerson, and Confucius. My dad always defined himself as an atheist. He had a very negative response to his parents' church, the Four Square, uh, which was founded by a California preacher, Amy Simpleton, Amy Simple McPherson. My former minister from LA told me that that was the original right-wing megachurch. And like so many of the fundamental leaders today, she was involved in an indiscretion. The Unitarian service was on the radio. I think that explains why I don't remember much about going to church. When I was eight, we moved far away, still in the sprawling LA to the port of Los Angeles. There was and is no Unitarian church in the blue collar town of San Pedro. My parents thought I should have some knowledge of Christianity, so they dumped me at the Episcopalian church where I went to Sunday school sometimes. I was so happy when I joined this UU church to find that our sung affirmation is based on that church's doxology. I gathered from the connection my parents had to the church that they embraced an independent search to define their own spirituality. In 1968, mom in her feminist era decided that God was a female. Here is some of our artwork, it's a, a relief um, tile sculpture of about six feet tall. Kind of hard to see, but 
there is God. Her jewels came from my um, biology textbook showing genes. So oddly, when I went to a Mormon college, Brigham Young University, I had to find a religion for defense purposes. <laughs> Needless to say, there were no UUs in Provo, Utah, but I did find the Baha'i faith, a prosecuted religion out of Iran. They believe in one God, so traditionally Unitarian in, in my book. They believe all religions which proclaim a God as one. They refer to many different prophets in many different cultures in many historical eras, starting with Zoroaster. In 1970, the liberal world religion was a good substitute for the Unitarian Church for me. Sadly, the Baha'is have not evolved and have some rather prudish attitudes now. There are so many who identify as Unitarians even though they are not active in the church. I know, I grew up Unitarian. Now we're going to have um, a hymn, number 311, Let It Be a Dance. That's because this was my dad's favorite hymn. Um, we are going to do the refrain and then just verse number two, and then the refrain again. Closing. <laughs> Blessed is the path on which you travel. Blessed is the body that carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that has heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift that you receive by going. Truly blessed is the gift that you will be, you become on this journey. May you go forth in peace. Since this is such an egalitarian church, I'd like to give you a choice of either um, the great American composer Scott Joplin or Johann Sebastian Bach. All right. Okay. Here's a ragtime dance that. I put together this morning with my bleary eyes.
Yes, coffee on the front porch, and don't forget to look at the memorial plaque in the narthex.